بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العالم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا رب العالمين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah, today we're going to be looking at the 22nd juz of the Qur'an, which is um, a continuation of Surah Al-Ahzab. And we mentioned yesterday that today we are going to be focusing on Surah Al-Ahzab, even though Surah Al-Ahzab starts in the 21st juz. But we didn't cover it because there's a lot of detail to mention. Now, with Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah Al-Ahzab being a Madani Surah, it deals with a lot of Ahkam, uh, rulings as well as the main theme of the surah which is the war the battle that took place the battle of al-ahzab also known as the battle of khandaq so inshallah we're going to be looking at some of the main themes of the surah allah azza wa jal he first of all speaks about certain jahili concepts um, that used to exist before the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, and even during the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah Azza wa Jal reveals these verses eradicating these jahili concepts The first concept is known as dihar Does anyone know what dihar is? Anyone know what dihar is? A bit more detail than that Yes, excellent, good Yeah, so they used to say in Arabic Anti alayya ka dhahri ummi yeah, this is this is a, a jahili way of divorce. Yeah, anti aliyya ka dhahri ummi. You are like the back of my mother. Yeah, or you are like my mother. And the reason why they used to say that is they used to liken their wives to their mothers in the sense that just as how their mothers are haram for them, then in the same way uh, they they would say to their to their spouse that you are haram for me as well, right? But this is a a weird uh, way of divorce that they used to have uh, during the days of jahiliyyah. Allah Azza wa Jal, in this surah as well as in Surah Al-Mujadila, Allah Azza wa Jal, He speaks about uh, uh, this concept of dihar and speaks about how uh, one should not uh, engage in this type of a divorce. Um, but if one was to do so, because it was a culture at that time, if one was to do so by accident or whatever, then there is a few things that a person needs to do. Uh, he has to give kafara. And the details of that kafara are mentioned in Surah Mujadila. Inshallah, when we get to the 28th juz, we'll, we'll look at that, inshallah. The second uh, concept, jahili concept, that, um, or a, a general concept that the, the surah deals with is something known as tabanni. Tabanni, anyone know what tabanni is? Adoption. Mm, adoption, yes. So basically, what they used to do back in the day, during the days of jahiliyyah, Anyone that you adopted as a son, they would attribute that person to the person that adopted that child. Okay. Now, does anyone know a Sahabi that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam adopted? Zaid. Zaid. Which Zaid? Zaid ibn Haritha. Yeah, Zaid ibn Haritha, uh, radiyallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam adopted uh, adopted him. And what people started doing was they started calling Zaid Zaid ibn Muhammad. Right? They start saying Zayd ibn Muhammad. Allah Azza wa in the first few verses of uh, Surah Al Ahzab speaks about, about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He says, uh, Allah Azza wa says that call them by the names of their fathers that is more just in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is when people started saying Zayd ibn Haritha once again. So Allah Azza wa He speaks about this at the beginning of the Surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, another thing that he speaks about in this surah is, uh, or another concept that he eradicates in this surah, is the belief that the jahiliyyah used to have, um, that one person, it is possible for one person to have two hearts. Okay. Now the reason why they had this, uh, this ide ide ideology was because there was one man amongst the Quraysh, he was known for his memory. Okay. He was known for his memory. So the Quraysh, they used to say that he's got two hearts. Yeah, he's got two hearts and that's how he's able to retain all of the information. As in his memory was so good that he would listen to, to something, he would read something and he would memorize it, he would never ever forget it again. Okay, so Allah Azza wa Jal, he says that مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ 
yeah, that Allah Azza wa has not placed in a single person two hearts. Now, what's interesting about this verse is Allah mentioned this straight after talking about the consciousness of Allah Azza wa Jal and uh, the opposite of being conscious to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So, in other words, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, even though there is a context to that revelation, there is also a personal benefit that we can take away from that. That no human being can possess two hearts. We know this. So, in the same way. You can't have the love of Allah Azza wa Jal and the love of dunya in the same hearts. Make sense? Right? So if there's only one heart, only one thing can exist in the heart. And that is the love of Allah Azza wa Jal and the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only that can exist in uh, a single heart. So this is another thing that Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about. Thereafter, from verse 9 all the way till verse number approximately 27. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about the battle of Al-Ahzab Known as Al-Ahzab in Arabic is the plural of Hizb Which means uh, group yeah, or confederate And Ahzab means groups or confederates It is also known as the battle of Al-Khandaq yeah, Which means trenches And the reason why it is known as the battle of the trenches Is because Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu he gave the idea to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to build trenches uh, on the outskirts of Medina to prevent the enemy from entering Medina. Now the reason why it's known as Al-Ahzab is because you had many different groups that combined together to attack the Muslims. Does anyone know which groups were involved? The Jews. The Jews. But which tribe from the, among the Jews? Banu Nadir. No Qaynuqa, no. Banu Qaynuqa still had a had a, a agreement with the with the with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Banu Quraidah. Any any other tribes? You had obviously the Quraysh, right? And then you had other tribes of the Arabs that did not reside in Mecca. Yeah, for example, the tribe of Ghatafan. Yeah, the tribe of Ghatafan. They were also involved, and there were other uh, there were other tribes that were involved, like the tribes that reside in Ta'i, for example. They were involved, Hawazin. Okay, uh, these are very strong tribes of the Arabs. So obviously, the Quraysh being the main one, they were coordinators of this uh, this battle. So now what happens is they all got together, and there was approximately ten thousand of them. Yeah, so huge, huge army coming towards Medina. Salman al-Farsi radiyallahu anhu came up with this beautiful idea of building trenches to prevent them from entering Medina. So now what happened, obviously I'm not going to go into detail, you can read up on this inshallah in any uh, book of seerah. What happened was they got to Medina, they obviously could not enter Medina because of the trenches. A few little, uh, you can say, uh, um, incidents did take place wherein uh, there, were, there were casualties on each side. However, what happened was there was an incident in particular that the, the books of hadith mention regarding a man by the name of Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. He was from the tribe of Ghatafan. He accepted Islam and he came to the ranks of the Muslims. And he addressed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and said, O Messenger of Allah, I've become a Muslim, but my people, the tribe of Ghatafan, who are on the other side, they don't know that I've become Muslim. So, O Messenger of Allah, do you want me to do anything? So the Prophet sallallahu said, look, if you stay here, then you've only added uh, the number of the Muslims by one. But if you go back to the, the other side, the enemy side, they still think you're part of them. You can basically cause fitna amongst them yeah, and, and, and uh, cause disunity amongst, amongst the, 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 the enemies. So Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud, he went back to the enemy side, to his tribe, the tribe of Ghatafan, uh, and obviously all of the other tribes were there as well. And what he did, they did not know that he was a Muslim. What he did was he started uh, causing discord, all right, for the sake of uh, the benefit of the Muslims. He started causing discord in the, the, the enemies. So as a result, what happened was they weren't really united, the enemies, okay, because they were all from different tribes. Tribalism basically kicked in, all right. And as a result, they seemed united when you look at them, but their hearts were not united. Thereafter, Allah Azza wa speaks about how eventually a time came where uh, how the battle ended was that a very strong wind uh, came, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from Allah Azza wa Jal, and the, the wind was so strong that the tents that they erected, they were uprooted, and all of the pots that they had, as in Allah speaks about all of this uh, in the surah, all the pots that they had, they overturned, and Allah Azza wa Jal talks about how he sent an army that they could not see. And as a result, because this dragged on for a very long time, 
they eventually gave up and they all started fleeing one tribe at a time and then even the Quraysh got up and they, and they left as well okay so this is this is what happened in uh, the battle of al hazab like i said I've, i'm not going to uh, much detail you can read up on this battle inshallah uh, in in any book of seerah so allah azza wa jalla speaks about uh, all of this in this surah it is also in this surah that allah azza wa jalla whilst talking about the battle of al hazab speaks about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being the best example, yeah? The best example that should be followed. So Allah Azza wa says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That most definitely in the Messenger of Allah is the best example. Now why is Allah mentioning this in the context of Al-Ahzab? Because Al-Ahzab was difficult for the Muslims as well. It is during this battle that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was approached by the companions and they said, O Messenger of Allah, they complained of hunger. They said, O Messenger of Allah, we are extremely hungry and then they showed they lifted up their shirt and they showed that they had one one stone tied to their bellies to keep their back upright because of the extreme hunger so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam lifted his shirt up and he had two stones tied to his belly for that same purpose it is also in this battle where the sahaba radiyallahu anhum they were digging right the the trenches they came across a huge boulder and they could not break that boulder. So they went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went down into uh, this, this trench and he struck with the, with the axe, he struck the boulder, he said, Allahu Akbar, and sparks came out of that boulder and he said that uh, the Roman Empire had been conquered and the Persian Empire had been conquered. And this is when the, the Munafiqoon, they were mocking the Muslims and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said that, look at this Prophet. He is dreaming about the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. Whereas, look at our state, we can't even have food at the moment. We're, 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 we're struggling due to hunger, right? So all of these incidents took place in the Battle of Al-Ahzab. So because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he led by example in every sense of the word. He led by example, Allah Azza wa Jal, in this context, he says that the best example that you can find and that you can follow, the best role model that you can follow is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thereafter, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala speaks about the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are certain rules that are specific to the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah Azza wa speaks about this in verse 31 to 34. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they should avoid soft speech and they should restrict themselves to their houses. They should establish prayer and give zakah and they should obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah azza wa jal uh, at the beginning of the 22nd juz speaks about how men and women are equal when it comes to their reward. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimati wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minati wal-Qanitina wal-Qanitati." And it's a, it's a long verse, and Allah mentions different different qualities that the Muslims, male and female, the believers, male and female, those who are obedient, male and female, those who fast, male and female, those give charity, male and female. So Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions male and female for every category to show that men and women are equal when they when it comes to their reward with. Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after mentioning all of these categories, Allah says, Allah Azza wa Jal has prepared for them uh, a, a very great reward okay, in the Akhirah. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about. Thereafter, we have the story of Zayd ibn Haritha. Once again, now you can see the link at the beginning of the surah, Allah spoke about the rules of adoption and how you should call them by the names of their fathers, not by the name of those people who adopted them. Now Allah speaks about, linked to this discussion, is the story of Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. What happened was, he got married to Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu anha, and the marriage didn't work out, and they divorced, okay? Now what happened was, Allah azza wa jal in these verses, he commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to marry Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu anha for one purpose and that purpose was to show the Muslims that it is permissible for you to marry the wife of your adopted son if a divorce takes place and this is to further emphasize the point that was made at the beginning of the surah that your adopted sons are not your sons by blood right they are only your adopted sons 
So this is why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he married Zainab bint Jahsh radiyallahu anha, and and by the way, uh, Zaid radiyallahu anhu, Zaid ibn Haritha is the only companion that has been mentioned by name in the Quran. Yeah, Zaid bint Jah, uh, uh, Zaid ibn Haritha is the only companion that has been mentioned by name in the Quran, and it is in this surah where Allah azza wa jalla says, "Falamma qada Zaidun minha wa taranza wajnaqha." Yeah, that when Zayd fulfilled his need, we married you to her, i.e. Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu anha. So this is another uh, benefit of this surah. It is also in this surah, in verse number 40, Allah Azza wa Jal, he makes it very clear that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final prophet, he is the seal of prophet. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّن رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ That he is the seal of the prophets. Thereafter you have the famous uh, verses of the Quran where Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks about dhikr, that you know, remember Allah Azza wa Jal um, in abundance. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he uh, in this surah also uh, says, uh, إِنَّ اللَّهُ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي The famous verse that Allah Azza wa Jalla and his angels, they send salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thereafter Allah commands the believers to also send salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another rule that is discussed in this surah is in reference to the rules of divorce. In particular, the rule of divorce for one who has not consummated the marriage. So if you have not consummated the marriage, what is the rule when it comes to divorce? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number uh, 49 speaks about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he says that, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا نَكَحْتُمُ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ تَلَّقْتُمُهُنَّ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ تَمَسُّوهُنْ فَمَا لَكُمْ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ عِدَّةٍ تَعْتَدُّونَهَا Allah Azza wa says that if you have not cons consummated the marriage, then the woman does not need to observe a waiting period. So you know the idda of a woman when a divorce takes place or when the husband passes away, usually the woman needs to engage in what we call idda, the waiting period. And the waiting period, it differs whether it is a, uh, whether it, a divorce has taken place or the husband has died. But there is no idda for a woman where the divorce has taken place and the marriage has not been consummated, okay? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that, uh, that the marriage has not been consummated, Allah says, فَمَا لَكُمْ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ عِدَّةٍ تَعْدَدُّونَهَا She does not need to observe her idda. So Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks about this in uh, verse number 49. Thereafter, Allah Azza wa Jal, he speaks about uh, the rules of hijab with regards to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That if you go to the wives of the Prophet وسلم, to ask a question, then ensure that you ask a question behind a hijab. فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ hijab. That ask them behind a veil. Okay. Thereafter, Allah also speaks about some etiquettes with regards to entering homes. That when you enter someone's home, uh, we spoke about in Surah Nur that the first thing you need to do is seek permission before you enter someone's home or someone's room. But once you have been invited to someone's house, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that once you have eaten, then you should disperse, you should not sit around and, in, and gossip. And this is what the Sahaba radiallahu anhum did once, and this is why these verses were revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, at the end of the Surah, Allah azza wa jal, uh, he reminds the believers not to be like uh, the Bani Israel were to Musa alayhi salam. So Allah says, لا تكونوا كالذين آذوا موسى Don't be like those people who harmed Musa alayhi salam. And throughout the entire month we've been talking about the story of Musa alayhi salam and the, the blessings Allah gave Bani Israel, their rejection, you know, uh, and the, the, the hard time that they gave to uh, Musa alayhi salam. So Allah azza wa jal tells the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the believers in general that don't be like the Bani Israel and how they harmed Musa alayhi salam, don't do that to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And thereafter Allah azza wa concludes the surah by speaking about amana. Allah says that inna aradna al-amana ta'ala samawati wal ardi wal jibal. That we presented amana, trust, to the heavens, the earth and the mountains, and they all refused to carry the burden of amana. However, human beings, they carried the burden of amana. Now the objective of this verse is to show the gravity of amana. When you have a trust of someone, when someone entrusts you with something, you should understand how great that thing is. 
which is why in in another verse of the Quran Allah Azza wa Jalla says inna Allah ya'murukum an tu'addu al-amanati ila ahliha Allah commands you to fulfill the trust to its people okay so any agreement that you make any trust that you have you must fulfill that trust to its people so Allah Azza wa Jalla this is how he concludes uh, surah al-ahzab after surah al-ahzab we have surah saba saba as ibn kathir rahimahullah mentions refers to the kings of Yemen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in this surah the blessings that he gave to the people of Saba and the objective you can say that the main objective of this surah is to uh, teach us the importance of gratitude because the people of Saba they were ungrateful for the blessings that Allah Azza wa gave them and as a result Allah Azza wa took all of these blessings away from them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah also speaks about the blessings that he gave to Dawood alayhi salam and Suleiman alayhi salam. What were some of the blessings that were given to Dawood alayhi salam? Knowledge. Knowledge. Mountain. Mountains would praise, yeah. Mountains would praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he would praise Allah. Anything else? And the birds. Harma. The birds as well. Uh, he would, yeah, he would, he would uh, melt uh, iron or he would, he would mold rather iron in whatever uh, shape he liked. Anything else? His voice. His voice, yes. He was in particular known for his voice. He had a very, very melodious voice. These were some of the blessings that Allah Azza wa Jal gave to Dawood And obviously the biggest blessing that Allah Azza wa Jal gave Dawood was knowledge and prophethood. And similarly, Sulaiman alayhi salam, we've spoken about him. Allah Azza wa Jal gave him, you know, the blessing of having a huge kingdom, subjugation of, of the wind, of the jinns, right? These were all blessings that Allah Azza wa Jal gave to Dawood and Sulaiman alayhi salam. The reason why Allah first speaks about these two prophets and the blessings he gave them, this acts like an introduction to the blessings of the people of Saba. So Allah Azza wa is saying that you should be, when it comes to blessings, be like Dawood and be like Sulaiman Do not be like the people of Saba. We gave them many blessings, but they were ungrateful to the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Now, what were the blessings of the people of Saba? Allah Azza wa speaks about this and he says, he, he speaks about how um, the people of Saba, they were given two gardens uh, that were full of provisions uh, due to which they had, you know, they had, they, they lived a life of Im, uh, immense luxury and comforts. And what happened was many prophets were sent to them, according to some scholars, uh, a total of 13 prophets were sent to the people of Saba to remind them and bring them back onto the straight path. Initially, they were on the straight path. Yeah, initially they were on the straight path, but then over time, luxury and comfort is such a thing that it makes you, uh, it makes you uh, uh, distracted. It distracts you from your true purpose and objective in life. So the people of Saba were like this. So they went, they went wayward. And these prophets came to try to bring them back on the straight path. However they, however, they rejected. They were ungrateful for the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result, Allah Azza wa just speaks about how he sent a flood and destroyed the, these two gardens, uh, beautiful gardens that the people of Saba had. And these gardens were a means of a lot of wealth for them. And obviously wealth means luxury and comfort. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سَيْلَ الْعَالِمِ yeah, وَبَدَّلْنَاهُمْ بِجَنَّتَيْهِمْ جَنَّتَيْنِ ذَوَاتَيْ أُكُرٍ خَمْطٍ وَأَثْلٍ وَشَيْءٍ مِّنْ سِدْرٍ قَلِيلٍ Yeah, Allah Azza wa Jalla says that we sent a flood. And this flood, the flood of Al-Arim, was so severe that it destroyed everything in its path, and in particular these two uh, gardens. So now they had no source of wealth. All of their wealth was destroyed because of their ungratefulness. Another blessing that Allah Azza wa Jalla gave them is whenever they would travel, because they were based in Yemen, whenever they would travel, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says that we gave them small towns and villages en route to their destination so that they could rest along the way. Because it was a long journey. Going from Yemen, so if you're good at geography, you'll know what I'm talking about. Yemen is, so you have Saudi there, you have Yemen over here, and then you have you know, Iraq on, on, on this side, and then towards this side you have Syria, Jordan, Palestine, etc. So now going from Yemen all the way over there, right? It takes a long time. Those days there were no planes, trains, etc. It would take a very, very long time. So Allah says that we bless the people of Saba that they could go into these towns and villages, they could rest, the people of these towns and villages could host them because it was a culture at that time to host the travelers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is another ni'mah that Allah azza wa jal gave to the people of Saba. However, they made an ajib dua. Listen to this dua. They said, Rabbana ba'id bayna asfarina. 
They said, oh Allah, we don't like it having this, this much ease, you know, we're, we're, we're constantly stopping. And the, the Mufassir mentioned that these towns and villages were very close to the actual main road. So the main road that they would travel, the, the towns were very easily accessible. So they wouldn't really go out of their way. It was very close. But despite this, they didn't want this. They wanted the journey to be long. So they said, oh Allah, prolong our journey for us. Okay, so Allah says, وَظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ They oppressed themselves by making this dua. They were ungrateful once again to the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Allah azza wa destroyed the people of Saba and the wealth of the people of Saba. And you know, subhanAllah, this verse, we can actually apply it to our day to day, right? We can apply it to the 21st century. Because when we go on a long journey by car, what do we have along the way? Service, service stations, right? So we can see that subhanAllah, you know, when we stop in the service station, okay, it's not a town or a village, but Allah Azza wa has made it easy for us, right? So now if you're going to go to London, from London all the way to, let's say, Edinburgh, yeah, a good six, seven hour drive, you're not going to be driving constantly, are you? You're going to take a break. But the fact that you can take a break is a blessing of Allah Azza wa So do you express gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that? Okay, this is one of the lessons uh, of this beautiful surah. Thereafter, we have Surah Fatir, another very, very beautiful Surah, Surah Fatir. Allah Azza wa in this Surah, He starts by talking in particular about the angels. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, Alhamdulillahi Fatir is Samawati wal Ard, Jail il Mala ikati Rusul and Uli Ajnihati Methna wa Thulatha wa Ruba' Yazidu fil Khalki ma yasha. Yeah, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says that Allah is the one who originated the heavens and the earth. Ja'ilil malaikati rusula Who has made the angels as messengers Then Allah describes these angels That some angels they possess two, three, four wings But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Yazidu fil khalqi ma yasha He increases in the creation that which he wishes Mufassir mentioned that that verse That part of the verse is in reference to Jibreel alayhi salam According to a hadith, an authentic hadith Jibreel alayhi salam was given 600 wings Right? 600 wings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the angels. And because um, this is a Makki surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks uh, mainly about uh, his creation. And among the beautiful, you can say, highlights of this surah, uh, if we look at verse number 5 of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a very important reminder. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna wa'da Allahi haqq. فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ Allah says, O mankind, verily the promise of Allah is true. So don't let this worldly life distract you. And don't let the deceiver deceive you in regards to the purpose of your life. And who is this deceiver? Anyone know? Shaitan. Shaitan, yeah? That's why Allah says in the next verse, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ فَاتَّخِذُوهُ عَدُوًا Shaitan is an enemy for you. So treat him like an enemy. Okay, so these are very beautiful verses, you know, straight to the point, very simple, and it's something that we can immediately take in, implement in our lives, right? Thereafter, if we look at verse number 15, again, a very beautiful, simple, straight to the point verse. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Ya ayyuhal nasu antumul fuqara'u ila Allah, wallahu huwa al-ghaniyul hamid. That, oh mankind, Allah does not say, oh believers, Allah says, oh mankind, all of you are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of you are dependent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're all fuqara. Yeah? And this is a very beautiful verse because Allah is not saying, oh poor people. Allah is saying, oh mankind. That includes the billionaires out there. That includes your, you know, your Jeff Bezoses and you know, all of these, uh, these rich people that you have out there. The billionaires and the trillionaires and the millionaires. No matter how much wealth you have, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying that أَنْتُمُ الْفُقَرَاءُ إِلَى اللَّهِ You are faqeer in the, in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because all it takes for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in one instant He can take all of your wealth away. Right? Which is why thereafter Allah Azza wa Jal He says إِنْ يَشَأْ يُذْهِبَكُمْ وَيَأْتِ بِخَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزٍ That if Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to, Allah could have destroyed all of you in one instance. And He could have brought an entire new creation. And Allah says that that's not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So this verse, it really breaks a person's ego. Any sense of arrogance that we may have, read this verse. Remind yourself of this verse. That number one, you are a faqir in the, in the, in the eyes of Allah azza wa jal. And number two, Allah is, in, Allah is not in need of you. 
Allah Azza wa can destroy the entire mankind in an instance and bring a new creation, right? That will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfill the duties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and that's not difficult upon Allah Azza wa Jal, right? So the objective of this verse is to instill humility and to instill this reality that we are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is not in need of us. Thereafter, we have verse number 32, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about three categories of people. Three categories of people when it comes to ibadah, when it comes to following the book, when it comes to following the Quran, there are three categories of people. Number one, Allah says, فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ that from amongst the people are those who they oppress themselves. Number two, وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ There are those people who are moderate when it comes to worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. And number three, وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ There are those people who they hasten towards goodness with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when we read this verse, we need to ask ourselves, which of the three categories do we fall under? Do we oppress ourselves, referring to sin, living a sinful life? Or are we moderate when it comes to, you know, our worship? You know, we pray sometimes, we don't pray sometimes. You know, we commit sins and we don't do tawbah sometimes. Sometimes we do tawbah. Ramadan, we become a bit religious. And, you know, after that, we go back to our old habits. And, you know, we're, we're all over the place, basically. Or are we in the third category? Sabiqun bil khayrat. Always running, racing towards goodness, racing towards good deeds. But one interesting thing that Allah Azza wa mentions here is... That these people who are racing towards good deeds, they're only doing so with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So what you need to do is, you need to ask Allah azza wa jal to give you the tawfiq, the ability to rush towards good deeds. But that needs to be followed up with an effort from your side as well. Right? The objective of Ramadan is to put everyone in the third category. Sabiqun bil khayrati bi But the test begins, my dear brothers, the test begins on the, day, on the day of Eid, when the barakah of Ramadan is no longer here, when the energy of Ramadan is no longer here, when the masajid are not as full as it is right now. Like if I was to, I was to see this on a normal day outside of Ramadan, this would never ever, no one would ever think that this is a Fajr Salah that we're sitting after Fajr, yeah, and we're listening to uh, the Quran, subhanAllah. But look at the barakah of Ramadan, look around you, this is the barakah of Ramadan. But when that barakah goes away, this is when the test begins. Are you going to stay in category number three? Or are you going to go back to number two and Allah forbid number one? Okay? So we need to stay in the third category. Sabiqun bil khayrati bi idhnillah. And this is what Allah Azza wa Jal mentions. And this is verse number 32. In verse 33 and 34, Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about those people who are in the third category. What's going to happen to them? They're going to end up in the akhirah, in paradise. They're going to reside there forever and ever. They're going to be adorned with bracelets that are made of gold and pearls. Their clothing is going to be of silk. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a beautiful thing. That when they enter Jannah, they're going to say, Alhamdulillah alladhi adhab anna al-hazan. All praise belongs to Allah who has removed all sadness from us. Such a beautiful verse. Yeah? This is a verse that gives us hope. If we are currently experiencing some type of sadness, some types of grief, some type of depression, whatever it may be, uh, any type of difficulty, emotional difficulty, this is a verse that gives us solace. That the time is going to come, if we are on the straight path, if we are in the third category, سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ A time is going to come where this sadness is going to end. This grief is going to end. And that is going to be when we enter Jannah. And it reminds me of a statement by... Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, someone asked him that, Oh Imam, when are we going to find rest? When are we going to find peace? So Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he said, عِنْدَ أَوَّلِ قَدَمٍ تَضَعُهَا فِي الْجَنَّةِ The first step that you place in Jannah, this is when you are going to find rest, this is when you are going to find peace. Okay? And what's interesting about this, the people of Jannah, when they enter Jannah, the first thing they're going to say is, Alhamdulillah. And when we start our salah, we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. To remind us that we want to be those people who are saying Alhamdulillah in this world, but Alhamdulillah when we enter Jannah. May Allah Azza wa make us from the people of Jannah. So these are a few selected verses from Surah Fatir. And thereafter we have Surah Yasin, which inshaAllah we'll be speaking about tomorrow as part of the 23rd Juz inshaAllah ta'ala. We ask Allah Azza wa to give us all the tawfiq. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi